Hi there. Welcome to our next session on our study in the book of John, chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 9 today, and we're going to go down to the end of 15. Jesus is speaking here to Nicodemus, who came to him and wanted to know more about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, there's some powerful, powerful things in these four verses here. So I'm looking forward to sharing them with you. I hope it's a blessing for you. So come with us on this journey as we see what Jesus has to say to us. Okay, girls, it's yours. Welcome once again to our Bible study in the book of John. Today we're in chapter 3, starting at verse 9. If you haven't seen any of these sessions so far, you can catch them on our uh, website listed below or on our YouTube channel. Also, I have a series there that I call Body, Soul, and Spirit, and you can get those in both places as well. If you would like to contact us for prayer or questions or whatever, my email is listed below here, and also our WhatsApp number. And if you'd like to be included on the WhatsApp group that gets these videos uh, directly to you whenever I send them out, you can just let me know and I'll add you to the group. So let's get right into our study here. Thanks, girls. So today we're talking about Nicodemus. Nicodemus had come to Jesus and he asked him about being part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus was asking, like, so how is that possible? How can I be born again as, a, as I'm an adult? And of course, then Jesus went on to explain that we needed to be born of water and spirit, the water being the flesh, our, our first birth, and then by the spirit, which is our second birth. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if you are in Christ, then you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So in today we're starting in verse 9 and Nicodemus says, How can this be? Nicodemus asks, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. Jesus is getting a little frustrated here, uh, it sounds like, because he is teaching the people, he is witnessing to the people about the things, and yet they, there's still so much doubt. And that's something that really affects us today, right, is the amount of doubt that we have. In John uh, chapter 6 that we'll be going into in a few sessions down the road here, in verse 29, when Jesus is asked by the people, what is the work that God wants us to do? He says, the work of God is this, that you believe in me. Satan is working so hard to bring doubt and unbelief into us. He says, you're one of Israel's teachers. Remember, Nicodemus was part of the ruling council. He wasn't even supposed to be going to uh, talk to Jesus. He was part of the ruling council. But he, he went that night and he's speaking to, to Jesus. So Jesus says to him, like, you're one of Israel's teachers. Do you not understand these things? For truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. So here, when he's saying this, I, th I think he's speaking more to the leaders, right? To the ruling council, that that's what he's talking about. Of course, we have the advantage of knowing the whole story, and that they never did accept Jesus as Messiah. They never did accept his teaching that they hardened their heart against uh, Jesus being Messiah. It's amazing because for many years, people have been looking for Messiah to come. In fact, even today, those who do not accept Jesus as Messiah, who are part of the Judaism, they still are looking for the Messiah to come. They're still looking every day for this Messiah to come that hasn't come, that they thought hadn't come. But of course, we know that Jesus is a fulfillment of all the prophecies. We know that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world, the one that came and died on the cross for us, rose again and is alive, interceding for us, sitting on the right hand of the Father in heaven. And that's an amazing thing, right? So he goes on in verse 12 here and he says, 
I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? So Jesus says, you know, I haven't even started talking about heavenly things. I've only been talking about earthly things. You know, I'm only testifying, telling you things of this earth. What happens when I start speaking about heaven? Then you guys are never going to believe me. You're not going to understand me. Verse 13, he says, No one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. So is this confusing to you? Is this a confusing verse to you? No one has gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. So the thing we have to understand here is there's a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And there's also a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant never actually started till Mount Sinai. So all through Genesis and Exodus, that was part of a, a time before the covenant was ever created. The covenant was created when Moses went up into Mount Sinai and got the Ten Commandments and God gave them the covenant, covenant that uh, we know as the old law, the Levitical law. And that stayed in effect until Jesus came, right? The Old Covenant did not end at the end of the Old Testament and the end of Malachi. From Malachi to Matthew, there was about 450 years where there was no writings, there was no word from God. So there's quite a space of time there. But the Old Covenant didn't start when the New Testament started. There's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So the Old Testament starts from Genesis to the end of Malachi. The New Testament, Matthew to the end of Revelations. That's easy for us to understand. But the Old Covenant started in Mount Sinai and went to the end of the Gospels until Jesus had died and rose again because the New Covenant couldn't come into effect until Jesus had died. So when Jesus is talking to the disciples and to, in this, in this situation, Nicodemus, they are still under the Old Covenant. And under the Old Covenant, nobody could go to heaven. So there was this place called paradise that people used to go to. If you remember when Jesus was on the cross and there was two men hanging with him, one was, one was ridiculing him and the other one was saying, no, you know, we deserve what we get, but this man didn't. And he says, you know, Jesus, remember this, remember me this day. And Jesus says, Let, uh, this day you will be with me in paradise. Paradise was into effect until Jesus had died and was resurrected. And then we go from paradise to heaven, right? At this point in time, nobody had gone to heaven. Now, in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had happened and the Holy Spirit came down on everybody and Peter got up and spoke the first gospel message, we know that 3,000 people were saved. So whoever the first one that got saved and died, they were the first one to enter into heaven. That's the first time a human being went into heaven. Because in this time, in this place where Jesus is speaking, he says, no one has gone to heaven. The only one who has been to heaven is the one who came from heaven. And he's talking about himself, right? He's the only one that had been to heaven. And no man had gone to heaven yet at that point in time. So you can just imagine when the first human died as a saved person and they went to heaven, imagine the rejoicing that was in heaven. Imagine the rejoicing that was there. You know, of course, there was great rejoicing when Jesus died and when Jesus ascended into heaven. But when the first human did, when the first human died and entered into heaven, I imagine there was a, a great amount of rejoicing. And, of course, it doesn't tell us who that was or we have no way of knowing who that was. But it was an amazing thing, right? Now, I'm not going to get into a theological discussion on about what happened to the ones before, you know, uh, that died before Jesus did. But Jesus says to us that John, there was no man as great as John the Baptist. And so he's including all the patriarchs and the prophets and, you know, Adam and Moses and Abraham and David and all the Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all those prophets. He says none were as great as John the Baptist. And yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist because John the Baptist died before Jesus uh, died on the cross and was resurrected. Remember, there's a big difference after Jesus died. 
And when he was speaking to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died, in John 14, he said to them, you know the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is around you, but soon he is going to be in you. And when he rose from the grave that Sunday, he met them in the room that Sunday night and he breathed into them the Holy Spirit and they received the Holy Spirit. That, so that, you know, there's a huge change that happens right in that time period that we celebrate at Easter. It's not only Jesus' death and resurrection that we, that we celebrate, but it's the it's start of the new covenant. It's the start of the, of the, the new uh the new covenant that we live under today, this dispensation of love and grace and peace that, that is given to us through Jesus, what he has done for us. And it's amazing when we look at that and we see this, and it's hard for our mind to, to conceive that before that time, no human being entered into heaven. And that's why Jesus says that no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And he came from heaven. So how can anybody else testify about what heaven is about, right? Nobody can because he's the only one who has come from heaven. Verse 14, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. I don't know about you, but when I read this story, Numbers 21, verses 1 to 9, it was a situation where the children of Israel were grumbling and they were complaining against God. They had fought uh, against another army and they, they were just complaining. And so God sent a bunch of uh, poisonous snakes, um, venomous snakes, into them, uh, into their crowd, into their midst. And the snakes started biting people. And of course, they were venomous snakes, so they were in a bad situation. But he told Moses to make a snake of bronze and put it on a stick and to lift that stick up. Now, I've heard some people say that with the stick and the snake, it was in the form of a cross. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It may have been, it may not have been. In fact, the medical system today all over the world, if you look at their emblem, it's a snake wrapped around a stick. And that's where this comes from. It comes from this story. So Moses made this bronze snake and put it on a stick and he lifted it up. And as people gazed upon it, they were healed from the snake bites that, that had happened to them. So Jesus is saying here, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, when I read that story, I was really confused when I first read that story because the snake in the scriptures always signifies evil, right? It always signifies Satan. So... I was confused, like, okay, God sends snakes, they bite the people, but then he wraps a snake around a stick and then lifts it up, and if people would gaze upon that stick, they would be healed. Now, we know from this scripture that this was a foreshadowing of Christ. So, why would he use a snake as a foreshadowing of Christ? Like, it makes no sense, right? Because... We all know that the snake was the one who deceived Adam and Eve in the garden that caused the sin to come into the world to begin with. So why would he use a snake? It doesn't make any sense when you, when you look at it in that light, right? But then when we go to the cross, when we go and see what Jesus did, you know, Easter, that's our time of celebration uh, when Jesus died and he was rose again. When we go there and we look at the cross and we look what happened to Jesus, what did Jesus do? He took on all the sin of the world. He took all of our sins upon himself and was lifted up. That's why the snake is there as a representation, because, because he became sin for us. And that's what the snake represents. It represents sin. So what God was doing in having Moses make this snake and put it on a stick and lift it up was to show us that Jesus was going to come and that he was going to take all our sins from us and that he was going to be nailed up on the cross. And so he says here, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay, and that's what happened. He was lifted up on the cross, right? When he went there, he took all of our sin. Imagine that. Just imagine that. Even, you know, I mean, this happened over 2,000 years before most of us were born, right? So... Even before we were born, he took all of our sin. 
Not only our sin from the time we were born up to today, all of our sin that we're going to commit while we're on this earth, he took upon himself and he paid the price on, on the cross for that. So in verse 15, it says that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So just as Moses lifted up that snake in the wilderness and the people looked upon that snake, they were healed of, their, of the snake bite. They were healed of the sin that had grab, grabbed hold of them. They were healed of the demon that had put that poison into their bodies. And they were completely healed. And so it is the same for us, right? When we gaze upon Jesus on the cross, when we come to the cross, when we come to the foot of the cross, when we look up at him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of what, I, what I've done wrong, the poison of the sin that is in us is released, it is taken out so that it cannot touch us anymore. Of course, Easter, you know, we celebrate the Passover from the children of Israel where the last plague uh, that happened on the children of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt was the death angel was going to go over the land and kill the firstborn of all the men and animals in the land. But the Israelites were told to take a lamb on the 10th day of the first month into their house to keep it for four days, then to kill the lamb and take a hyssop bush and dip it into the blood of the lamb and to sprinkle the doorposts and the lintel with that blood. And when the death angel came over, he would see the blood. He would go over that house. He would not touch that house. So long as they remained under that blood and inside the house, and they had to eat the lamb. They had to eat all of the lamb. They couldn't clean the insides out and cut the heads and the feet off. They had to kill it, drain the blood, take the blood, put it on the doorpost and lintels, then roast the, the lamb that way with its head and in its innards and everything, and they had to eat it before morning. The whole thing, everything. Sounds gross, doesn't it? But, you know, that's the way it is with Jesus. You can't just take the choice parts of Jesus, the parts that you like, and not take the rest of them. You have to take all of them. And that's what, what that symbolizes for us, that, that Jesus was a, Jesus is a Passover lamb for us. He's, he's the one who has delivered us from the death angel. Just like that snake when it was up on the stick and the people gazed upon it and they were healed from, their, from the poison that was put in them. It's the same thing for us. When we gaze upon Jesus, he is our lamb. But we must take all of him just like they did on the Passover. When they had the Passover, they had to eat the whole lamb. The head, the feet, the insides, everything. And nothing was to be left till morning. And so it's the same thing for us. We have to take Jesus in. We have to take all of him into our life. And when we do that, when we're willing to do that, when we're willing to gaze upon him on that cross, when we're willing to see what he has done for us and we accept the payment he's done for us, then we have eternal life in him and through him. Eternal life has come to us. What an amazing thing, right? What an amazing thing to, to experience that eternal life. I have already started my eternal life. I don't know about you, but for those of us who have accepted Jesus into our life, our eternal life started on the day that we accepted Jesus. Now, one day this body is going to die, but that new creation that is in me is going to live forever. It's going to continue. It's going to continue on. I'm not going to have the use of this body anymore, but I'm not going to cease to exist. The moment I step out of this body, I will be face to face with the Lord. And that's going to be an amazing day, right? So for each of us, this is the thing that Jesus has done. He has taken the bitterness and the poison out of us that sin has injected into us. And he's released that poison from us so that we can have eternal life. An amazing thing. Thank you for joining me today. And I uh, hope you enjoy this session. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his goodness, for his love. Father, we thank you that he became sin for us and was lifted up on the tree, that he became the tree of life, that we could partake of that fruit and have eternal life. For that we are truly thankful. Father, for those who are looking for something in their life, something that is missing, Father, we just pray that Holy Spirit, you would just, you would just hover over them and show them how much Jesus loves them, how much the Father loves them, and how much we love them. We thank you for the opportunity we have to make these videos, Lord. It is such a blessing. And we just pray that they go out and that they are effective for each one that watches them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks for joining me. We'll catch you on the next session. Okay, girls, take us home.